be in the back? Everything's yeah. good? All right, my wife says I have a loud mouth. It's coming in handy today. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say is, how many people here are actually interested in a career in law or government? Okay. All right, so we've got about, about maybe a third. How many of you just are interested in, in following that kind of stuff? And how many of you here for class credit? Who's, who just likes following this? And who's here for class credit or just morbid curiosity? Oh, good. Class credit in uh, future lawyers and politicians, great. Right? We all put a good start. Yep. First thing I'd like to start off and talk about with Governor is your overall arching judicial philosophy. As you heard me just talk about a few moments ago, four Supreme Court justices were born in the uh, 1930s, which means the next president could have an impact of up to four justices <coughs> retiring in the first term or the early part of the second term of, the, of the, their administration. So my question for you would be, what types of individuals would you appoint? And as you answer that, explain to the group your overarching judicial philosophy as you appoint them. Well, first of all, uh, I actually have appointed a few judges when I was the governor, and uh, most of the judges, almost all the judges are elected in Virginia by the General Assembly, by the legislature. But I actually appointed a few judges. The answer to the question is that I'm a University of Virginia trained lawyer. I understand what the Constitution is all about and why we have to stick with it. The real challenge we're seeing today is the, the, the collapse of the, of, of the Supreme Court. In major policy areas, the people of the United States have lost confidence in the Supreme Court because now they think it's all politics. It just depends on whether you win the presidency and you're a conservative or whether you win the presidency and you're a liberal. And so now we're either going to appoint liberal Supreme Court justices or conservative Supreme Court justices. And therefore, the system of the law appears to be rigged. And everybody kind of thinks that now. People have lost faith in the Supreme Court. What I would like to do is to restore some faith in the Supreme Court. So the direct answer to your question is, if I become the president, I'm, I'm not going to be looking for litmus test people. What I'm going to be looking for is for people who will obey the law, will understand the Constitution, will understand the historic background of the Constitution, and why, for example, I'm a Second Amendment gun, you know, a gun advocate, because I understand the history of the United States and why that's built into the Constitution. And uh, I want somebody who's going to understand legal precedent and follow legal precedent, and if you're going to break away from legal precedent, then you ought to have an analytical, solid, policy or legal reason for being able to do so. In other words, let's bring some professionalism back into the Supreme Court of the United States. I am a conservative. I'm going to want to understand when I talk to people whether or not they're going to say, okay, now I'm going to get to be on the Supreme Court. I'm kind of the guy that ended up in one of the most powerful political offices of the country, and now I can remake all of society in my own image. I don't want that person. I don't want that person. I don't want somebody that's going to force a policy change down the throat of the American people because of the unlimited power of the Supreme Court in order to issue cases to guide people and make them do things. If they're going to issue these kinds of rulings, there ought to be a genuine interpretation of the law, and it ought to be one based upon sound intellectual and legal analysis, justification legally. If you can't get there, they ought not to go there. And to put some liberal, extreme liberal, which would be worse, but to put an extreme conservative on the bench would be continuing to undermine the law in this country. So that's the way I'm going to hit it if I uh, get an opportunity to appoint these people to the Supreme Court. I'm going to try to actually restore people's faith in the law. You, you said that you would not have a litmus test, but are there any questions, specific questions that you want to ask your uh, potential appointees to the court? No, not in terms of asking them for an outcome of a particular line of cases or a line of thinking about where a case might go. I wouldn't do that. But I, I want to return to this point, General, because it's the central one. I'm going to try to find out whether the person says, okay, I haven't had the discipline or the courage or the guts to run for office and subject myself to the democracy. But because I'm a lawyer and I play backroom politics, I'm going to get to be a judge. I'm going to get to be the judge. And now I'm going to have a chance to make all the rest of America run their businesses, their lives, their religion, their value, and everything else by my standards. That's the kind of person I'm going to be looking for so that I cannot appoint them to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, 
for those of you who are going to be going to law school, you'll learn this. There are two kinds of people, generally speaking, um, when it comes to applying or reading the Constitution. There are people who view the Constitution as a living document, which means that it was uh, drafted several hundred years ago, and the, the document lives. It actually changes as society changes and as culture changes and as people's view of the world change. And so therefore, the Constitution that was written 200 plus years ago is, can be interpreted uh, through, the, through the lens of the person reading it at that time. Others view it uh, through an originalist point of view, which means the document was written, it has an original meaning, and if you want to change it, you have to amend it. If you want to pass laws contra that contradict it, you have to amend the Constitution. So um, what is your view? Do you, do you read the Constitution as an originalist or as someone who sees it as a living document, and why? Uh, your General, this is uh, actually kind of a tough question. Tell you the truth, I don't think this is a black and white. I would love to be able to answer black and white because I'd like y'all to run right here and say, "Oh, the guy knows what he's talking about. And he's decisive." Uh, this is a harder question. Okay, first of all, I am an originalist and I am a strict constructionist. Uh, I think that that the founders got it right, and I think the values expressed by the founders were right. Uh, and though, and therefore, I would like the Constitution to uphold the various liberties that are enshrined in the American ideal, which are embodied in the Constitution. That's the, the direct answer. There's your black and white answer to your question. The more subtle answer is that sometimes we have to address the fact that America is changing. America is evolving, and it is different now than it was then. So the classic answer to that more subtle question is, let's remember that when the Constitution was formed, slavery was the law of the land. And that uh, uh, it was a problem that, that was postponed by the Constitution, and it had to be resolved. Uh, and it could have been resolved politically, and it wasn't resolved politically. The Dred Scott decision, for example, was an originalist type of, of, uh, of decision. It was positively wrong and made the Civil War inevitable. And think of the, the terrible consequences of that. Politics in this country still are flowing sometimes from the, from the great conflict. So the point is that there has to be some recognition of the change of American society, but there are universal values that I believe still are enshrined in the Constitution, and we should be working every day to uphold those values. That the values of the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the challenge that we see right now while people are pushing against the freedom of religion even the, because of the separation clause, whereas there the, the, the establishment clause, whereas the, the freedom of religion very much needs to be enshrined and recognized in the Constitution. There are others as well. The Second Amendment is completely under attack right now. And, uh, you know, I believe, I believe the Constitution was formed at a body of people who understood what was really going on during the American Revolution. When the British Army marched out of Boston, to go to Lexington and Concord, they weren't going out there to sun themselves on a nice weekend. They were going out there to capture the firearms of the colonists and to disarm them. That's what they were trying to do. So as a result of that, the founders put the Second Amendment in place, and the Heller decision has confirmed that. Do you know, do you know folks, there was actually a move to try to say that firearm rights were only for the militia? you imagine that? That's been the conventional thinking, remains the conventional thinking uh, in some quarters of this country. That is not true. That is not true. The right to keep and bear arms is an individual right which confirms the individual liberty of the American people. The responsibility and the empowerment of people. We Americans believe in the empowerment of the individual. That's what creates a free society. And so that's what the founders were thinking about. So therefore, I think that we ought to be in a position to uphold those values, but those values are under discussion each and every day, including in this presidential campaign. I hope that's responsive. Mr. Pete, you've already answered a couple of questions in the back, so we're going to go quick here in a second. Before we move on from judicial philosophy, what, um, what recent, and by recent it could be in the last 10 or 20 years, what recent Supreme Court decisions do you disagree with the most and why? And if you could do that in about a minute and a half, because I want to move to the next area. Oh, wow. Uh, sir, could you hand me that iPad, please? I did a little work on this uh, in preparation for this. Let's see if, uh, General, I can put my hands on it. What do I disagree with? 
bad decisions. There was, I can come, to, I can remember right off the bat that uh, there was a decision that Cleo here is right here, the, the uh, Kello versus City of New London. What that case was, was a question of whether or not the government could take the, your real property and then dedicate it to some other public purpose. We all know about eminent domain where if you're building a road, you can take a person's property so you can put the asphalt over it. We all understand that. This was a case where uh, a person's private property was taken in order to give some development project in order to improve the tax base. That was a decision that permitted that. That's wrong. That was a, a, a bad decision. I think Roe v. Wade is a bad decision. I think you can debate the uh, the right to life issue. Probably people in this issue in this room can debate it all day and all night. But just to sort of make up a certain set of standards that had no basis in law or the Constitution whatsoever and just throw it in takes you back to that principle that I was laying. People have lost confidence in the courts because they think they're just making it up as they go along. And there's not really any law or constitution really. It just depends on who's on the court. That was really the sin of Roe v. Wade, not to mention the fact that it opened up that uh, tremendous issue. I talked about the Dred Scott decision. Uh, you know, the, I, you know, I, I think that when I, when I was at law school, I always understood that um, the states decided the qualifications for marriage. Uh, I don't think that the decision that, uh, that uh, certified same-sex marriage was probably a very good decision. So these are, these are issues. Oh, there's been a whole raft of decisions that have allowed Obamacare to go forward, specifically the one that, in, that requires people to purchase from a private company health insurance under Obamacare in order to keep Obamacare alive and moving. That's a terrible decision. If you can make people buy health insurance, you can make them buy anything. What is it that, we, that you would want the government to go over here today and tell you to spend your money to go buy? That's, that's a bad decision. So, you know, those are the ones that I think that were off the bat that I would have some challenge with. Thank you, Governor. We're now going to move into executive action. Now, as Attorney General, I have dealt a lot with the executive overreach of the federal government. A lot of people say, you know, we want the federal government to do X, Y, and Z, and I always take the position is it's not enough that you do the right thing. You have to do the right thing the right way. So a lot of times when I'm challenging an executive overreach, I'm not so much against the intent of what they're trying to do at the federal level. I'm against the fact that they're doing it the wrong way. Uh, they're encroaching on the state's prerogatives on the 10th Amendment. A couple of examples. Um, a bipartisan Congress, bipartisan Congress says over the last 30 years have identified Yucca Mountain. Y'all familiar with Yucca Mountain? That's a nuclear repository out in Nevada. And they've spent billions of dollars uh, studying that from an environmental standpoint to make sure it was safe and efficient way to store our, our, our country's nuclear waste. Um, South Carolina has paid, is the third highest paying state into that nuclear waste fund. Um, you pay, right now, you pay those fees every time you pay a utility bill. And so that money was collected over 30 years and several years ago, the Department of Energy just unilaterally decided we're gonna shut down Yucca Mountain. Forget what Congress said, forget what Congress authorized, but just unilaterally the administration shut down the system. Now maybe you're not for Yucca Mountain, maybe you are for Yucca Mountain, but the end of the day is billions of dollars were spent so that we could have a place to store our nuclear waste. The federal government said, South Carolina and states, thank you for the billions you gave us, but you can still, we're going to take your money, but you can keep your waste. And that, that, that was done unilaterally without, without Congress approval. There's another one recently, and I want to read it because it's actually interesting. A case I joined Texas in a year ago this month, um, in November 2014, the president, when talking about his immigration executive order, said, I just took action to change the law. Well, think about that for a second. A person took action to change the law, a phrase that the White House later kind of phrased as it was more colloquial, uh, him speaking colloquial. This was in reference to his executive order on immigration, which would allow 5 million illegal immigrants to remain in the U.S. And they based it on prosecutorial discretion. Now, it doesn't matter what your opinion is on immigration or whether or not you think they should stay or go or how they should go if they are to go. The question is, uh, my question to you is, do you think that the use of executive orders by the president in lieu of congressional action is the appropriate way to go? And as president, how would you uh, balance those two powers? No, I do not believe that. I think if the president basically changes the law by executive order, then you are losing the whole system of American government. 
Well, that's where President Obama has really made the grave error to <coughs> undermine the entire system of American democracy by issuing an executive order that was plainly lawmaking as opposed to law implementation. The executive orders are for law implementation. We don't give the president the right to make laws. We give that to the Congress. And as frustrating as that may be, we can't help that. Uh, the, it, the, the American philosophy of government is that it's better for the Congress to deadlock than it is for a dictator just simply to draw, to draw an executive order and, and change the law. That's the direct answer to the question. I can elaborate a little bit more because it's my way of getting guys to vote for me or not. I don't know. Uh, Trump. Uh, I have broken from Trump on his approach to immigration. Uh, I know that people are angry, in fact, particularly here in South Carolina, people are angry about the immigration issue and they're resentful. I know this. Uh, and I do believe that there are some things that we can agree on, like controlling the border. I think that we ought to have controls over a nation state's border and all that. But I just I break with him in a couple of in a couple of ways. Number one, the Constitution has said that a person who's a natural born citizen of the United States is a citizen of the United States. Trump would like to change that interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Would like to change that and to say that uh, to really throw into question young Latino, young men and women and children as to whether or not they should be natural born citizens of the United States. 14th Amendment was put into place to make it crystal clear that African Americans, either born in slavery or not, free people were clearly citizens of the United States, both in our American history and certainly in foreign countries' history. We know that when you start messing with people's citizenship, that is a harbinger of great danger. Trump is wrong about this in order to exploit the anger and resentment of the American people regarding the immigration issue. He is endangering and undermining the liberties of the American people. And I disagree with him on that. Secondly, this morning, this morning, General, Trump has said that he wants to put together an immigration force to go ahead and track down people and put them in boxcars and ship them away someplace else and you know, to, to, to export them from the United States. I can't think of a worse message, it's just a practical matter, I can't think of a worse message to send to Latino citizens of the United States that they are under attack, basically, by the Republican Party. If this continues on, they had no chance the Republicans win the 2016 election. And that's why I reject it as strongly as I possibly can. So, you know, what's the Gilmore proposal? Well, I mean, I think the people ought to come out of the shadows here and work in order to get on a work permit to be able to work here legally, the people who are already here, because we've inherited that problem. I just don't agree with the Trump type of authoritarian, totalitarian type of solution. I just don't agree with that. But to answer the question, okay, so that means that the president's getting almost to the same place I am. Oh, by the way, I do not believe in the past of citizenship people who are here who have broken the law and here and here. That kind of answer I don't support. But bringing people here and bringing them to some sort of legal status and then drawing a strict line on people who want to come here illegally in the future would be my approach. So aren't I really landing in the same place Obama is? Almost. The difference is I would never, ever undermine the system of free liberty lawmaking in this country by issuing an illegal executive order. That's what the president did. If he wants to argue on behalf of a proper solution, he needs to go back to the Congress, I don't care how gridlocked they are, or go over the heads of the Congress to the American people and persuade them to pressure their Congress people. But don't just issue an executive order that's illegal. Once again, just like the Supreme Court point general, you're undermining America's uh, belief in its own system, and in the long run, that is very hazardous. To just kind of bring it back to why the issue of executive action is so important, why you should care about it. So maybe you're a fan of what the president or this president or a future president is doing. If they do something unilaterally that you agree with, it creates a precedent that future presidents will follow. So you may like the fact that the, 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 the president is doing something unilaterally today, but in four or eight years from now, there will be a different person in the White House, and they will do the same thing that you will hate. And the thing is, is they're going to say, well, President Obama did it, President Gilmore did it, President whoever did it. And so that is why how you do something, how you implement your power is so important because it creates a dangerous precedent. You, 
touched on the Gilmore plan, and I think we started talking a little bit about it. My next question was going to go to specifically immigration. Did you, do you want to flesh out your plan a little bit? Or well, talk a little bit I'll, I'll add to what I already said. The problem is that we've got 12 million people here right now you live. They didn't all come across the board. <coughs> Big percentage of them, I think I've seen a number of over 40 percent, came here perfectly legally. But then they didn't leave on time. They overstayed their visa, they overstayed their, their permission to be here in the United States and remain here and are here now. So you know, what do you do? What do you do? Well, I'm not putting people on boxcars and sending bad messages to the Latino community that we don't like people. That anger and resentment is demagogic and dangerous. And I'm just, look, I'm just going to tell you that. Guys first in the polls. Maybe I ought to become a demagogue too. Maybe I could be first in the polls. But I'm just not going. Uh, and I'm going to try to send a message that's a bit more welcome. But uh, we also have to hear the law. Can it be American policy? I'll ask you, what is immigration policy in the United States? You can ask your liberal friends, what's their policy? Is it the policy that all you have to do is get here? Just get here. Doesn't matter how it is, across the Sonoma Desert. Overstay your tourist visa, come under some other condition, just get here, and you get to be a citizen of the United States. From whatever, whatever place in the world, doesn't matter, it didn't just all Mexico or South America, any place else in the world, you can just get here, you get to be a citizen of the United States. I don't think that could be the policy of this country. I think we have to decide for ourselves who gets to be a citizen of the United States and who doesn't. So, my policy is this, with this inherited mess that we've got here, let's bring people out of the shadows, give them an opportunity to have a work permit, but not an amnesty with the path of citizenship. Secondly, from this point on, strict rule. If you overstay or you come here illegally, you must be deported. Third of all, we control the border to cut down on this problem to the greatest extent we can. Fourth of all, sanctuary cities. Where sanctuary cities have said, we're going to be so lenient on immigrants, we're not going to obey the federal law. That must be abolished. Sanctuary cities cannot be permitted to exist. Uh, General, I'm, I'm sorry to have to, to tell you this, but I'll, I'll tell all of you all this too. Uh, I, I'm a big student of history. I read a lot of history. And we Virginians kind of got the message. You can't just disregard the federal law. You just can't. Right? I, we learned this lesson. We learned this lesson in Appomattox. So the, the point is that uh, sanctuary cities that say they're going to disregard the federal law are apart and cannot be permitted. It's almost a standard amount of treason. So that's the direction I'm going. I think we can solve the problem. I think we can deal with this issue that's fair and reasonable and something the American people can have confidence in. Brett, do you still have your constitutional pen on you? I signed it earlier. Red, Red's got a pocket constitution here. Well, that constitution is, you can get it anywhere you want. Pocket constitutions are free. You can probably order them online, too. But it's a, it's a handbook on how, how how this country should govern itself. It's a how-to manual. And if you go to the first three articles of the constitution, article one basically says, legislative branch, these are all of your powers. These are all the things that you can do, and these are the things that you can't do. And you go to the second article, it says executive branch or president. These are all of your powers. These are the things that you can and can't do. And then you go to Article Three, that covers the judicial branch, the third branch of government. It says this is these are, this is where your authority comes from. So if you go to the very end of the Constitution and if you look at the first ten amendments, the tenth amendment, the last amendment in the Bill of Rights, and I'm going to read it word for word because I don't want to misread it. It says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So the rules not the powers not given by those three those articles, uh, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So basically, the tenth amendment says if it's not listed in the Constitution as a power, then it belongs to the states. That's what it says. South Carolina gets to do everything that it's not that is not prohibited under the U.S. Constitution or not delegated to Congress or the President. So that's going to lead me to my next question. How would your interpretations of the Tenth Amendment shape your policy views or plans? And should Supreme Court justices interpret the laws in light of that? I, I told General Wilson before we came in here, I don't know what the other candidates have done, but I'm a trained lawyer. 
and the former Attorney General. And I frankly think a lot of this stuff is complicated and subtle. I don't think it's just black and white. It's probably just non-trained people who think that it is. Okay, look, the Tenth Amendment is intended to keep the power in the states over things that states ought to be dealing with. And I believe in the Tenth Amendment general, and I, and I support the Tenth Amendment. I am also a nationalist. I believe that in the modern 21st century, the challenges that are ahead of us and that we're facing now, I believe we are one nation. I don't believe we really are a confederacy. I believe we are a un un unity of, of states in the United States of America. And if, we're, if we ever let that go, we're not going to be powerful enough to address the crises that are coming and we're with us now and will be in the 21st century. I believe this. I believe the founders intended to restrain the federal government from becoming a dictatorship by saying that individual states could be a block on universal, unlimited federal power. I still believe that, and I think that that is appropriate. Furthermore, I come out of it as having been the governor of the state of Virginia. So I know that when I was governor, you know, uh, the state, the federal government all the time wanted to come in and impinge upon our authority of the state of Virginia, and I never let them do it. I always struggle very hard to maintain the sovereignty of the state of Virginia in appropriate places. So this is a, a, a trade-off and a balance, and it's very, it's, uh, very complicated. Uh, let's also remember that the law has evolved to grant more and more power to the federal government over time. The commerce uh, power, for example, has now, under one of these uh, cases, as a matter of fact, uh, has almost said that anything can be regulated under the commerce power. The Obamacare decisions are very serious because they basically say the federal government can direct you to, to in your personal behavior and your buying and selling as to what you're going to buy and what you're going to sell. That's very, very dangerous and, and probably has to be reversed at some point. But when Obamacare care collapses and is replaced by a market-based system, a lot of this will go away, so it'll be okay. Uh, but uh, uh, the goal here is to understand what strengthens the nation within our framework of individual liberties and what doesn't. And when the federal government wants to overreach and go too far, the Tenth Amendment ought to be there. Which has been out of favor, quite frankly, General, for a long, long time. Yes, sir. Um, another area I want to talk about is the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And uh, I don't know if this is something that folks in college need to think about. I know I wasn't thinking about the EPA when I was in college. But I, I do want to give you an example of overreach to get your opinion on it. Recently, the EPA has put out a rule called the Waters of the U.S., or WOTUS, and basically it means the federal government under the Clean Water Act can regulate any navigable water in the United States. So when I think of navigable waters, what springs to mind is the Mississippi River. I mean, that, that, that's the easiest one I can think of. But navigable waters are waters that are interstate, and, and they, they, you, you can travel them, you can use them. Um, but the EPA has rewritten the Waters of the U.S. rule to say that Congress or the, 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 so the administration can regulate, the EPA can regulate and require you, if you have a ditch going through your backyard or a ditch running through your, the property that your business is located on, and several weeks out of the year, it is filled with water because of the rainy season. That could be under the definition of a water of the U.S. In order for you to build your property or to sell your property or to conduct your business on your property, you would have to get a federal permit. So my question is, you know, I know that the intent of the WOTUS rule is to protect the environment, and there are a lot of other rules I'm not going to go into them, but how would you balance, that's just one example, but how would you balance, Governor, the need to protect a livable environment with the reality of the cost of regulations on citizens and private businesses? I'll give you the direct answer. The overall philosophical point that I, I think I would make is I feel that um, environmental issues are becoming a vehicle for the left wing in this country to try to control every aspect of our lives because they think they know better. And so they're looking for methods to, to do that. Climate change may very well be one of those. If you can say that we're all going to die unless the federal government can regulate the way we live every day, then they got to regulate the way we live every day. Uh, I worry about that with respect to that. The Environmental Protection Agency is a much more direct vehicle that's in use uh, right now. So I'll give you the, the uh, direct answer, but I'll also preface it by saying my wife Roxanne is a, she's actually a, a classic scholar and teacher at Randall Lincoln College in Richmond, but she had a chance to go to uh, China several times. I don't know if any of you here have been to Beijing. Has anybody here? Some have. 
Uh, I am told, I have not been there, but I am told it's absolutely awful that it's heavily polluted. And you almost can't walk around the streets and see anything. And you get this stuff all over your skin. It's pretty, pretty awful. We don't want that in the United States of America. We all want clean water and clean air. The question is, has the Environmental Protection Agency now become almost a semi-religious body that is trying to actually regulate people's behavior and conduct? And I think that it has. Uh, the answer is that I believe, the direct answer to your question is, I think that they have gone over the balance and they're, they're now going too far. And what they're doing is not keeping their eye on the ball which is that we have to have decent ability to earn a living and to, and to engage in commerce or our people can't work and you can't get jobs. And that is the challenge that we're facing. So there's an article I read by South Carolina just recently, as a matter of fact, and there were workers out here that are very angry and resentful because they're not getting the advancement. Wages, we all agree, are not going up. Just not. And, you know, it's because we don't have a robust enough economy. Some of the people who are working at a local facility in South Carolina pointed out that the Environmental Protection Agency came on the land, reviewed everything that was going on, and found an oil puddle over on the side, off to the side, in one place. And they, they fined the company $10,000 uh, for having that oil puddle. Built. Well, the problem with that is they don't understand that when you find a company like that, $10,000, you're taking away a job. That money, that's money that could be used to invest in the company to buy computers and equipment and so on to hire more people in order to do more things. They don't understand that. Uh, if, they're, if, they, if they have the capacity, General, to regulate through navigable waters, and in any water that is moving is a navigable water, they can control everybody and everything. This is wrong. If I become the president, we're going to change the orientation on this. I'm not going to eliminate all uh, clean air, clean water type of regulation. But we are going to put this back into balance. And I'm going to make sure the wrong people aren't running this thing and on some power trip to try to destroy the American economy. Now, I'm going to, I've been given a five-minute warning, so we're going to go through this real fast. Wow. This is an important issue. It's a, it's a social and contemporary issue, but this summer, same-sex ruling has kind of, the Supreme Court has answered the question once and for all on, on gay marriage, but this question is in regards to religious liberty. And I wrote the question specifically, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to misstate the question. This summer's Supreme Court decision on gay marriage has created many more questions regarding the role of government and whether or not a person can exercise their personal religious convictions in the workplace. Everyone that I speak with believes that gay couples should be treated fairly under the law and the dignity. But there is a great deal of concern among many that the government, in an effort to protect gay citizens, is overstepping and punishing people with personal religious convictions. What comes to mind is Kim Davis in Kentucky. That's one of the more high profile. There was an Oregon cake baker fined $135,000 because they didn't want to uh, work at a same-sex wedding. A wedding planner who was fined in Florence who came under fire for not wanting to participate in a religious service because of their convictions. Agreeing or disagreeing with their convictions is one thing, but what should be the role of the government? And as president, how would you balance protecting of those persons' with religious liberties in the workplace without discriminating against the rights of same-sex couples? Well, they, one, of the, one of the cases I think you all might want to look at is Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. That was a recent case, 2014. That did say, the Supreme Court did say that if you have a religious conviction regarding contraceptives, that you're not obligated or forced to provide contraceptives if you think that that's against your religious beliefs. That's the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, personally, I think that, uh, that a person who's a private person in a, in a bakery ought not to be forced to sell to somebody like that uh, if they don't want to. But on the other hand, this flies in the face of the civil rights cases where there were people in the South who, uh, and again, I'm a Southerner, we're all Southerners, most, most of you, many of you, uh, that were discriminated against people on the basis of race uh, through, through saying that they had religious convictions. And that was wrong. And it was unacceptable, and those cases were clear and, dis and decisive. So this is emerging right now as, as a real issue about this. I would err on the side more of being respectful of people's religion in commerce than not. Uh, 
However, uh, you know, again, this is a, a, a real subtle problem. And, uh, I, and I, you know, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you're going to get to, to the bottom of this issue. Uh, I will take, just to give you where I finally come down, I'll take the Kim Davis matter. Does anybody know who Kim Davis is here? Some of you do. Kim Davis was a clerk of court in the state of Kentucky who basically said that she was against same-sex marriage. She was the clerk of court, and therefore she would not issue marriage licenses to gay couples, even though it was not a law of land, the law of Kentucky. And she would not do that. Uh, I've got to tell you a couple of things. Um, I believe that if you're a public official, generally you have to obey the law. So I don't care what her view is. She can leave off the clerk's office and vacate that office and believe that is a free person in the United States of America any way that she wants to. But if she takes the oath of office and says that she has an a, a, a obligation to, to be an administrator of the law and to uphold the laws and the Constitution, that's what she has to do. So in short, I would not have done what Mike Huckabee did. I've gone out there and done a press conference where he held up an arm and all that kind of thing. Frankly, I don't know how you run for president and say you're going to uphold the Constitution of the United States and do a press conference like that. So that's... My, yeah, my final question, and, and I don't know if we have time for Oh, one. by the way, I believe, I believe in, in marriage between a man and a woman. I mean, that's what I believe. But I also believe in the law, and I believe in the hearing the law. Um, just because it's very uh, prevalent right now in South Carolina, in South Carolina, most people here know that we had a, a horrible shooting involving a police officer and an African-American man back in April, uh, Walter Scott, and then, of course, a uh, month and a half, two months later, we had the massacre at Mother Emanuel in which nine people were gunned down. And then you had uh, a number of high profile shootings around the country, some involving law enforcement and, and minorities, others involving just citizens on citizens. But there seems to be, uh, you're seeing it percolating, especially the Black Lives Matter movement, that there's just, um, people are starting to have a distrust in law enforcement. I'm as pro-law enforcement as they get, and I'm a big defender of law enforcement, and I believe that local law enforcement uh, should have the support of the governors, the local officials. But my question to you is, with all the things going on in this country involving how law enforcement is being perceived, what role, if any, does the President of the United States have in supporting law enforcement and bridging the gaps that many and some minority communities feel along with those who are putting their lives on the line every day in the law enforcement yeah, I, I believe the president has been exploiting the racial issue in order to support to get voters for his Democratic coalition. That's what I think he's been doing. And I think it's all That's what I think. Now, here's, here's, here's the more complex answer. I was the Commonwealth's attorney for Henrico County. My job there was to rule on police shootings and whether or not police <coughs> had done the right thing or the wrong thing. And, you know, when the police break the law, and we have seen some videos where they're broken the law, then they should be prosecuted. And it's up to public officials who hold public office to make sure that the police are held accountable. I believe we've gone too far, though. Uh, I believe that we are sending a decisive message into the country today that the police are crooked, dishonest thugs. And as a result, they should be prosecuted, arrested, and taken down as much as possible. That will lead to chaos in the society. Why should the police go out there and take their chances on behalf of the community if they're going to be sued and not backed up by their elected officials, unless they're shown to have broken the law. So I'll give you two quick examples. I know we're at a time, probably out of time, but I'm having a lot of fun here. Uh, let's give a couple of examples. I saw a case, and you did too, a while back, where a, a policeman shot a man down and then took the firearm and took it over and dropped it next to the guy in order to imply that he had had a firearm. I don't know what's going on with that police officer, but I hope he goes to the penitentiary at the very least. That uh, yeah, that was Charleston, South Carolina? Here. Well, I, hope, I don't know what's going on with the officer, but I hope he's being prosecuted. I hope he's being prosecuted successfully. Uh, 